Southwestern family of companies welcomes you to the Action Catalyst. Each week, our diversely and amazingly accomplished guests share their insights and inspirations to help us ignite our own. So let's invest attention together to breathe, to reflect and refocus, and decisively defeat that voice we call Mr. Mediocrity. Then let's enjoy moving forward to make a positive difference in our world. Privileged to be your host, this is Dan Moore. Welcome to the Action Catalyst. This is your host, Dan Moore. We all know at the moment we're going through a global pandemic. And so we thought it would be valuable to have some perspectives from some people that work internationally. In fact, they have clients that span the globe and how they have dealt with the crisis and how they've worked with their teams and how they've kept things focused on growing their business despite it all. These are two longtime colleagues of mine. They're the co-managing directors. Managing director is a UK term, the same as president here of SBR Consulting. SBR Consulting works with companies in a variety of fields around the world to improve their sales enablement and their sales leadership processes. These gentlemen have um, between them some 60 years of experience in sales, in leading salespeople, and in helping organizations really achieve all their potential. First of all, we're gonna meet Alan Morton. Alan is based in Bristol, England, co-managing director. Uh, Alan started in the Southwestern Advantage Summer Program and became a very top rated consultant with SBR Consulting before moving into the area of leadership that he is in today. An accomplished guitarist, he is a fun person to hang out with, and I think you're going to really enjoy the things he shares. Stuart Lotherington, co-MD. Stuart lives in the south east of England in Kent. Stuart started in the direct sales business when he was just a student or recently out of school and continued on to build two different sales organizations and companies before joining SBR Consulting and helping clients in a variety of industries across the globe. Stuart is an extreme athlete. He and his partner, in fact, were the winners of what was called the Polar Challenge, a foot race to the North Pole starting off in Finland. It's exciting to have both of them here. So let's switch now to Alan Morton and Stuart Lotherington coming to us from England. So gents, welcome to our side of the pond here for a few minutes. Thanks for having us, Dan. Yeah, thanks Good. for inviting us. Stuart is in Kent, uh, just south of London. Alan is in Bristol, which is a bit to the west. And they have been sheltering at home and working furiously from home. Why don't we uh, start with just uh, the briefest pivots in, in your own lives that have kind of led you to this point, some of the significant career happenings and so forth, knowing that you could each write books about this, which I hope you will do one day. Stuart, let's start with you. Okay, sorry, Dan. Um, yeah, sure. Well, I, um, I started my career um, in sales, actually, in back in um, 1988. So I've been doing it for 30 years. Obviously, I started probably when I was around five years old. That's what I keep saying to myself. Um, and I did that um, working in the UK and the USA, actually, over the next 10 years, um, build up a sales team of 250 salespeople. But after 10 years of doing that, I then went into um, and changed into doing a different organization, still in direct sales, um, in gourmet food, um, set up our own business. Um, and one of the things I sort of learned from that was actually sometimes partners don't work out, but actually in the beginning, it was very successful. Two and a half years, we built up uh, 40,000 regular buying customers in the southeast of England. Um, but after five years of that, I decided to sell my share of that. And that's when I joined SBR Consulting, sort of 14 odd years ago and ever since that been working as a consultant um, most of which has been alongside Alan in that period of time um, to where I am today. That's fantastic we'll talk a little bit about the teams that each of you have developed a bit longer. Alan how about you pick up with your your main story? Yeah absolutely uh, well I was uh, minding my own business one day on the campus of Bristol University here in the uh, the UK when I was approached by somebody about the uh, the prospect of uh, going and learning how to sell in the US and at that point um, as a friend of mine had, had been out and worked in a summer program I, uh, I thought well if he can do it I can and I joined our family of companies working in our publishing division the Southwestern Advantage. Um, that was meant to be a, a one summer adventure and uh, it, it turned into a couple which actually enabled me to fund my postgraduate education we went on and did a master's in marketing um, off the back of that, I was fully intending to launch out into a career in marketing, but uh, the, uh, the 
the sales bug had hit me. And I decided at that point that I actually quite enjoyed building teams um, and uh, was approached to actually take over our UK division, um, ran the UK arm of Southwestern Advantage with uh, students from all over Europe, um, learned a tremendous amount through that. And when the time came to draw close to that chapter, uh, I approached our uh, our mutual friend, uh, Lars Tevez, about the potential of joining the consulting division that had been set up a few years earlier. And uh, the variety and the, uh, the, the interest that's been peaked through working with lots of clients since that point has kept me within the business since that point in uh, 2006. So uh, that's, uh, as she was says, about 14 years now within the business and uh, still enjoying the adventure of working with lots of uh, different clients, a very diverse client list in different sectors. Well, speaking of adventure, you have both been on an amazing adventure associated with COVID-19. Uh, just for our listeners to know, SBR Consulting has worked with more than 650 client companies from all over the world doing sales enablement, sales leadership enhancement, and programs to help companies sell better and elevate the practice and the profession of sales. But more than 90% of your revenues came from face-to-face -face presentations. So in the middle of March, when everything very, very rapidly shut down, including being with people, I wonder if you could each share some of your, some of your personal reactions as this was unfolding, and then, uh, and then professional responses as well because both of those are very important for, for our listeners. So either one can start. Happy, happy to um, jump in on this one. Um, I think like probably most people, there was a real up, up and down, topsy-turvy kind of world that was sort of flipping um, as that happened. We um, in the UK were impacted earlier than most other UK businesses because a large amount of our business at the time was actually in Asia and um, and other international engagements and so all of those got cancelled um, or at the time postponed um, very early on so we were impacted pretty early in fact in February it, it impacted us from a delivery standpoint um, and then as it sort of unfolded um, even more the uh, the challenges and the, and the way that clients reacted um, quite in you know I would imagine in a typical way you know the the invoices stopped being paid the um, uh, clients were cancelling or uh, allegedly postponing their appointments which is understandable because there was no um, contact anymore and so all of a sudden from a very full kind of amount of business that we had we actually ended up with very little to to be working on and had to obviously change our tack considerably around that um, on the, on the plus side, the, um, it allowed us to start working internally on the team. So it was really conscious to bring the team very closely together. We were able to work out um, all our operational issues and challenges that we've been facing and always been putting on the back burner and focus on some of the strategy that we're working on as, a, as an organization. But equally, um, it pulled the team hugely together. And in particular, we were able to produce um, some outputs, some you know, complementary workshops and support and um, webinars for our clients to really help them understand how they could deal with this current situation, which actually meant that the team started becoming to work effectively together. And it was, uh, it was actually very intense, very intense few weeks, or in fact, a few months in fact, um, but very productive. That's fantastic. I, I know that you were embarked, uh, just completed your, your best year ever in revenue as a company, and we're having a fantastic start to 2020. Alan, what could you add to that? Yeah, I, th I think to that point, Dan, you know, it, it really just the, the, the immediate personal response is uh, that sense of, uh, I think every, every time that you feel you're on a certain path, look out because something's going to come and, uh, and knock you off that path. And uh, so th there was, you know, we never know what it's going to be, but, you know, to a certain extent it was, I don't think any of us anticipated or expected this situation, but um, the, the, the immediate personal response was, okay, well, here, 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 this is the challenge that we're going to have to work through this year, is it? And, um, you know, like sure, you know, very proud you know, of the way that the team um, have adopted and stepped up because, you know, the immediate concern, obviously, personally, is everyone okay? Um, the, then that steps into, okay, what do we need to do professionally to make sure that the, the business is going to continue and to be successful? And, 
you know, having laid out a strategy at the start of the year, I think what we very quickly realized is that we were going to need to do a pivot. But um, I, I was grateful that one of the things we'd had spent some time and invested in the, the year before was really redefining our values, drilling down on those, um, really thinking about the behaviors and the attitude that underpinned the words. And uh, one of those was, uh, you know, the fact that we find a way. And so, you know, it, it seems fairly prescient that we spent a lot of time talking about what being a wayfinder means uh, to then have this, uh, this challenge and opportunity put in front of us to actually, uh, actually put into practice some of the things that we talked. So from a professional standpoint, you know, everything focused on that. Actually, what can we do to be authentic to what we'd said that we would do and find a way to succeed despite what was going on around us from a, an aspect of what wasn't controllable and to make sure that we really drilled down and focused on what is controllable. Mm hmm you know, that's really a key point. The fact that you had been through the values clarification workshop and that the team united around a set of values, one of which is finding a way. When we hit a crisis like this, it lets us know if we're just speaking and blowing smoke or if we actually believe what we say. And obviously you both do. It's impressive. Uh, uh, absolutely. And I think that really it just highlights again the, the value of that type of exercise, you know, as you're building a team and you know, we, we continue to build of, you've got to have that, you know, unifying set of standards, values that we hold each other accountable to. So uh, let's just say I'm, I'm glad that we did that. And, uh, you know, no doubt those will evolve over a period of time, but I, I think that find a way uh, value will re remain consistent throughout the, uh, the future of uh, SPR as, uh, as, as certainly what we can see from the team is that they're constantly looking and striving for a way that they can do that. Right. Was well, Stuart, inside of a week, you had put together a webinar that the team put, put on called Selling Through Disruption. I remember seeing a screenshot of one of your younger team member holding up a device and kind of frowning into it like, how in the world do we work this out? And since then, you have had hundreds of people attend webinars. Uh, there's a conference on the Art of Selling Consulting Services that is a paid conference that done in a virtual manner is the highest subscription that we've had in many, many years for that conference. So clearly, you're, you're delivering value. What, what would you say from your standpoint, Stuart, you've done to keep the team, first of all, believing, because situations like this can cause people to go into despair, particularly when their income is entirely driven by revenue. And you see the revenue faucet gets shut off. Uh, so what are, what are some sort of team leadership insights? Because you've done a magnificent job with that, both of you with your team. Well, uh, you know, as, um, as Alan just mentioned about, um, you know, finding a way is one of our core values. And so um, what I was really impressed with was that that ran throughout the entire organization. And invariably, it's normally the people at the cold face, the client facing that you think need to be epitomize that thinking. But in reality, um, our operations team were just as much um, part of that and making sure they find a way. So it made it really um, easy for us in the fact that they they just organized themselves immensely quickly and were able to adapt. Um, and that's that, you know, I think there's some of those individuals there have had a, been a shining light on being able to create you know, the works that we've been able to do. The other one, um, another one of our four values is actually we're practitioners of what we preach. And so I think in reality, because that's driven into our underlying kind of DNA of us as an organization, it was, again, I think something easily to rely on because um, our team, you go, well, what would our clients want to be? What, if you were to consult your clients right now, what would you be saying for them to go and do? You know, and we always say that we're practitioners of what we preach. So exactly what should we go and do? And um, I still hold that to this day that I think the entire team has continued to act as if we were advisors of ourselves and we're just we're showing, you know, suggesting what we're actually doing to our clients. And it seems to be holding true. We've been having some very successful um, interventions with our clients, obviously having to pivot now to a kind of a virtual world. And, uh, and more and more clients are now beginning to see that. So it's great to see that sort of pivot happening. But the key um, difference, I think, was communication. So in any kind of crisis, it was making sure we upped the amount of communication that was going on. There's probably in any normal office environment an awful lot of unconscious communication that's going on that keeps that team and that glue together. But in reality, 
um, when you've taken that away and you're now working in a virtual world, it's very easy for people to feel um, a, a dis, you know, disparate or not connected in any way to the organization. So early things that we adopted was increase the intensity of team meetings. Um, the huddles were introduced into the team um, because there was an awful lot of email traffic that was going on and it was actually almost too much. And so it was, it was one of the... Um, outputs that we had to be able to keep that um, working internally and it also meant for continued greater collaboration within the entire team very true one anecdote i thought i would share one of the team members is is sheltering out in a country place without reliable connection so only on top of a nearby hilltop and this team member is actually working out of the back of a horse trailer <laughs> and that has been the remote office to get proper connection and do client service and do sales calls and all the rest of that. That is finding a way in a big, big spot. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think adding to that as well, then the, you know, seeing the opportunity that sits in that and, you know, one of the things again that we've shared with clients and talked a lot about internally is, you know, everything starts with attitude, as you well know. And you know, uh, you know, are we looking out and seeing opportunity, um, or are we looking out and seeing challenge? And I give Stuart huge credit. I've seen many of his talks where he, he shares opportunity is N O W H E R E. So it can either be read no here uh, now here or nowhere. And you know, I, th I think what we've seen within the team is that they're definitely interpreting that opportunities now here. That example you've just given with the horse box, I know uh, was posted on a, uh, a well-known uh, social platform. Various responses came back from that, which were used as actually, well, here's an opportunity to re-engage in some conversations. And some of those conversations that were started with that have now turned into meetings and opportunities. And, you know, I think that's exactly the type of mindset that has working with the team has been a real pleasure is that they've been able to pivot, show creativity and just have a proactive and positive mindset when it comes to how they're going to address something which is entirely outside of their control. Well, one of the remarkable things about both of you is you are extremely strong individuals, very knowledgeable and yet very willing to let go of responsibility to share with others, to empower them. It doesn't all have to center from you. And I believe that's been one of the real keys to help the team stay really engaged, fired up, and at least the team meetings I've attended, a lot of excitement and, and even joy in the chaos. So hats off to you both for that as well. Now, part of what you do is you, you consult with very top sales officers. You, talk, you consult with CEOs of companies. And I'm sure that along the way, some of them have been in situations of near despair, not sure what to do and where to turn and how to make things happen. And many of our listeners are in that category, either in a personal level or in their businesses. So I thought it would be really useful if each of you could just maybe share your reflections on, first of all, how do you personally keep optimistic? Um, what are the steps that you take to, to focus on things you can control and things you can influence and, and not let that despair grab hold? Uh, this is sort of a, a lesson time, I suppose, because I know I would learn a lot from this. So Stuart, what would you throw in there? Yeah, so um, you just sort of referenced one of the models that we sort of stand by, and I was lucky enough to come across this some 20-odd years ago around CIA, control, influence, and accept. Um, and it's something that I stand by completely. So I think with all of us thrown into a turmoil in a very different situation, and you know all our domestic lives are being come into the forefront, and everyone's looking into everyone's houses, you know, looking in childcare and uh, all of those uh, challenges that now face right in front of you for everybody um, can be very chaotic. And of course, for those that are working in industries that might be deeply affected by this current situation, if temporary, if not temporarily, for on a more permanent basis, it must be very challenging. The factors that I've stuck to is that it's the saying that resonates with me. In fact, the saying actually was introduced to me on my very first day knocking on doors on a cold January the 3rd morning of when I'm learning how to go out there and, and, and um, go and knock on doors selling aerial photographs is actually how I started. And um, one of the first lessons I had was just control the things you can control and don't worry about the rest. And even though I've had that in my head for the last 30 years, it's, it's as much prevalent now as it's ever been 
to actually think, well, what are the things you can control? And invariably, from an experience of kind of a really challenging financial crisis that happened in 2008 and 2009 and working with a lot of clients in that sort of situation, what was evident to me is the businesses that succeeded were the ones that just focused on the things they could control. And it's the same on an individual basis. Um, we can't really control um, what's happening with COVID. We cannot control what the um, government's going to do and what's actually happening. But what we can control is what's going on in our head. What we can control is we can plan. We can sort of set a schedule. We can design to a certain degree our day. It may never work out that particular way. And if you look at my diary right now, it's a, it's a complete patchwork of all sorts of meetings that are taking place that are moving around the entire time. But it is something that we would encourage everyone to do is to take at least some degree of it, because if you gave a task to somebody um, that is organized over someone that isn't organized or plans, you'd have more faith in the planner than the non-planner, even though we all know that plans do go to all over the place, go to parts. So um, the first thing is control what you can control. The other thing is, is there's a huge amount of influence things that you can influence out there that are impacting us massively so. So um, the big difference between now and maybe 10, 15 years ago is we now probably all got data feeds of information and news and it's never positive stuff that's coming in. So our phones could be pinging from news agencies left, right and centre, um, you know, and all our digital papers that we'll read, it's never going to be positive stuff. And of course, when we turn on the news on the television, there's even more information there which will obviously accentuate the actual situations that are going on and so um, one thing you can influence is the reduction of that I'm not saying we don't need to know what's going on but actually the reduction of that because all of that is feeding into our unconscious mind the entire time and I would always recommend people to to, to reduce that but also I think there's a thinking around all the things that have been good that are happening and I appreciate there's a lot that isn't but all the good things around us to remind ourselves that it uh, that there are lots of good things that are happening um, to ourselves. Um, my personally, you know, experiencing the fact that I am able to go outside, that I, I do have a garden that I've not really had any time with, you know, um, spending quality time with the family are all these kind of things that we weren't around beforehand. And then, and back to that point of that controlling what you can control. The A is accept. What are the things you should just accept? And um, the model that we use in that particular sense is if you spend more time in the area of things you can control, your sphere of influence gets bigger. And it's difficult to conceptually understand unless you become an advocate of diary or schedule management, of actually um, diarizing things or scheduling things that you want to achieve and actually um, and then setting them out there. Um, and then you start becoming to realize that your sphere of influence does get big, bigger. And so I've, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of that from uh, juggling four children and uh, doing endurance sports and studying a psychology degree as well as um, being a senior partner in the business as well. So it's something I've done for quite some time now. So basically really understand the C and the I and the A, control what you can, influence what you can, try to accept the rest. Reduce the negative inputs from the constant drumbeat of bad news that's broadcasted. Uh, make sure that the schedule in your diary is reflective of the real true priorities and stay focused on that. And then take time to recognize the good things that are happening. That All of that is what restores a sense of optimism and keeps us from being paralyzed. That's a good lessons there, Stuart. Fantastic. Alan, what would you add? Well, I think building on what Stuart said there, you know, this is the great thing of working with someone that you're you're very aligned with because uh, I'm, I'm nodding as as Stuart's talking and, you know, just recognizing. I think you know, as, as Stuart said, sometimes partnerships don't work out, but sometimes they do, and I think that's about having a shared set of uh, you know uh, beliefs as well as values that we talked about and everything Stuart's uh, just touched on. I'd echo and. I think I'd, I'd just add to it in terms of as we think about the controllables, it's, it's that activity part is obviously significant. But I think alongside that as well is also the, uh, it, it's making sure that it's intelligent activity. And, you know, the, the, the value of stepping back and just actually recognizing that 
you know, as we said at the start, potentially the, the plans and the strategies that we had for the year have been somewhat disrupted. But there, there's always opportunity um, if we're prepared to look for it and, you know, actually stepping back and thinking, well, you know, thinking in terms of absolutes never works. Always and never are words that we should always remember and never to say, I believe, is, uh, is, is something that was once shared with me. And, you know, recognizing that, yet yeah, there's, there's a lot of challenge out there, absolutely. But there are pockets of opportunity. There are uh, market sectors and verticals which um, are experiencing an uplift. And, you know, with our, a lot of our clients and the, the sales teams we work with as well, we've been trying to help them to identify those areas and just recognize actually by putting their focus and their efforts into the right areas, they can still be successful. And I, I think that goes back to recognizing the belief and, you know, alongside that, making sure that, you know, those successes that people are having are visible. And that we're promoting it to Stuart's point. So many of the feeds that come into us are negative, but we need to proactively find the good news, share that, recognize the little victories, the successes that people are, are having, both within our organizations and outside, and share some of those great examples that inspire the rest of us. So, you know, I think um, you know, just building on what Stuart said is it's it's really thinking about what are those things that can feed us constructively and positively. And uh, I love what you mentioned around finding the things to be grateful for. The thing I'd add is let's also find the things there and identify the successes that we're having on the, along the way as we all look to pivot into areas that we didn't potentially have in our minds at the start of the year. But yeah, yeah opportunities there, let's go find it. Right. So uh, keeping the awareness that there's going to be pockets of opportunities, even in the middle of an apparent disaster, keeping your wits about you. Uh, I know in your case, keeping a great sense of humor for both of you is extremely important because otherwise we lose that perspective. So these are, these are really valuable. Uh, for our listeners, many of the clients that SBR Consulting has are in the travel space. So can you imagine when travel is basically cut to zero, the impact that has on the clientele? But because of these gentlemen's own personal sense of centeredness, they're able to help pass on that optimistic message and constructive process to the clients. So I think that's really remarkable. So here's kind of a philosophical question. Um, we've all heard lots of people speak about getting back to normal. And you both heard me say, I think we should instead think, let's go forward to better. What are some of the sort of permanent permanent lessons and learnings that you feel like can enhance what you do going forward as a result of this immense disruption in everybody's lives? Well, if um, I, th I think what is interesting around something like this is that invariably we're all going through change. Change is something we all have to accept. Um, one of my clients has told me that actually their industry has had to advance and they reckon it's at least five years worth of advancement in the last three months to be able to pivot effectively to be able to deal with the market challenges that are facing them. And I'm sure that's reflective of an awful lot of things. And I think what's highlighted here, and we, the term I know some people don't like, but the new normal is a term and it's almost still as um, thinking potentially as a temporary thing going forward. But um, I'm very excited about the opportunity going forward because actually from a, from a business point of view, we can get in and talk to people now. It's acceptable to do virtual meetings where it was not acceptable necessarily all the time. So it's, that's part of it now, doing the virtual meetings. Now that allows us to be able to work anywhere in the entire world. So the, the, mo the, the market has opened up incredibly as a result of that um, to do that. In addition to that, and as, as, as Alan just mentioned, you know, activity or staying on, you know, things that you can control, but doing activity is a key part of it. While our activity metrics, and even in our own organization, have, have doubled, have nearly doubled um, from our normal delivery um, side of it. And the team, we, we suggested this to the team and not a single person pushed back on that. They all accepted the challenge that we needed to double our activity um, metrics around that and of course by doing it virtually it does give you a much greater opportunity to have a number much more meetings than you would normally do with your clients and the ability to reach out to clients um, the daft thing in, in, um, 
in, interesting thing is that actually when it comes to reaching out clients is one of the things we always want to do is reach uh, build some sort of rapport in the beginning of the conversation well for the first time probably in the history of the world everybody's got the same rapport message that they could start a conversation with but um the other the other thing that i would also say around that is actually it allows talent um you know there's a great opportunity for talent to be joining your teams and we know and, and and you know one of the things I've, I've taken away from the team we've got is it's an incredibly talented team i'm very proud of the team i know alan is as well and um but it does give us an opportunity to still pick up some quality talent that actually could be working anywhere um that could be in part of your organization your team and not being restricted by geography um in, that you would have been up till this particular point so in my mind the market is now completely opened up. People have accepted this as a form, which I think is going to be around indefinitely going further forward and um, certainly for the foreseeable future. And it, and it allows us to increase, you know, uh, be able to attract talent, find talent and be able to be a lot more, um, you know, much more able to encompass, you know, a greater team going forward. Right, right. That's a, a really keen insight because there's not as much time spent in planes, trains, and automobiles. Why not double the activity metrics that end up producing revenue? I think that's very key. And the team responded because each of you leads by example and makes that happen. Alan, what would you say? How can we go forward to better taking these learnings and transferring them into a brighter future? Yeah, I've, I've, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, was, I spent some time earlier um, today, um, but in fact, all day with a, with a client of ours that is a consultancy working in digital transformation. And, you know, again, as Stuart shared an insight from one of their, one of his clients, um, these guys have seen a massive acceleration in terms of some of the programs which were in flight and a commitment from organizations to truly leverage the, the, the potential of technology to, you know, evolve and transform their, their businesses. And, you know, I think um, some of the changes that we've seen aren't, aren't going to go away. And in our industry in particular, again, that use of technology platforms, you know, we're, we're chatting on Zoom at the moment, um, whatever the platform may be, but that actually that recognition that you can pull a global team together um, and have a very effective workshop that's facilitated by someone in one country to a group of people who are potentially in six or seven different countries, that that can only be beneficial in terms of speeding up decision making, um, in terms of creating better agility for businesses to be able to respond, driving down costs, um, obviously uh, the environmental impact of, of travel. You know, all, all this. There's multiple benefits. That I think potentially what this has helped us to do is to actually break through some of those limiting beliefs that we all had about what was possible through using technology in lots and lots of different industries. And you know, I think that can only be a good thing from a productivity and effectiveness standpoint. And you know, I'm really grateful for the fact that because we have a global client base, um, I think in the, uh, in the initial four weeks of lockdown, um, I spoke to 58 sales managers across about 18 different countries when I, when I taught it up. And, you know, we were all talking about the immediate impacts that we were seeing on our teams and our businesses. But, you know, throughout that, the, the overwhelming sense was actually some of this change is going to stay. And as you say, it's forward to better because, you know, the direction of travel was definitely, um, you know, towards efficiency, effectiveness, productivity. But I think, I think we're going to get there a lot quicker now. And, you know, that, that can only be exciting for us once the obvious disruption of the last few weeks settles down and we, we settle back into a rhythm. I know there's certainly things that I'm hoping we don't go back to, um, mm. which is potentially one way. So, you know, I certainly don't want to go back to the way they were. I'd like us to take the lessons learned and actually apply those to, to make sure that we can all be more productive moving forward. Well, that sounds absolutely fantastic. Well, gentlemen, I can't believe the time goes as quickly as it does, but with you two, you've got so many insights, so much good to share. This was very thoughtful. Uh, listeners, we're recording this at the end of a long workday for these gents, and they're still pulling it through together to help us all with their encouragement. So on behalf of all of our listeners, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Stuart for being a part of the Action Catalyst. Great to speak. Thank you, Dan, for inviting us. 
If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. To stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst and Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. Thanks for listening. This episode is sponsored by Southwestern Coaching. Southwestern Coaching has helped over 12,000 people increase their incomes by over 25% on average. As a successful salesperson, you know the importance of increasing your sales, but sometimes you might just need a little extra push and accountability to meet your goals and grow your business. Southwestern Coaching will help you increase your income through one-on-one sales and leadership coaching tailored specifically to your needs. Together, we will elevate sales. To schedule your free one-on-one business action planning session with a Southwestern coach, go to www.southwesternconsulting.com forward slash action catalyst.